Well, hello and good uh, morning, at least here in uh, the uh, European zone. Today, I have a super interesting guest with me, and that is Luke. Uh, hi, Luke. Good morning. How are you doing? Hey, Michael. How's it going? Thank you for having me on. Hey, that's super. super I'm super excited. Um, I, we're going to mainly talk about your new thing there, uh, .mesh. But before we get to that, can you give you know the audience a little bit of a, a background, like what have you been doing before that? So this is your new uh, venture there. Um, you know, many there are many other things I can remember that uh, might be of interest. Like what 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 have you done before? What are you doing right sure. now? Um, yeah, so I guess I'll I'll start by talking a little bit about Cluster HQ. So Cluster HQ is the company I founded previously, um, and uh, we were working on uh, making stateful containers a reality for people. So basically making it possible to run databases and other uh, workloads that include data um, uh, functional in a uh, microservices containerized environment. Um, so uh, I, uh, I was involved in developing Flocker, which was the open source project at Cluster HQ. Um, with Flocker, we did a lot of work. I mean, the industry was super early at that point. Like that was the year that Docker just sort of started exploding. Um, so we're talking 2013, 14? 14, 14, I think, was when we really sort of got involved. We pivoted something we were doing previously. Uh, we actually had a, uh, um, a ZFS-based uh, uh, distributed web hosting platform on FreeBSD um, that we pivoted nice. to, uh, to, um, to sort of start serving the Docker market. Um, but the interesting thing about Flocker was that it was so early that we had to do a lot of hard work to just connect containers to storage at all. Um, and so, uh, so we, um, we integrated with uh, EBS on Amazon and Google Persistent Disks. We integrated with Cinder um, on OpenStack. We integrated with about a dozen uh, different storage vendors for their SAN products. And, um, and we managed to get Flocker into a 1.0 and uh, into production um, uh, with a big customer Swisscom. So that was great, um, apart from the fact that then Kubernetes came along and did the same thing. And so <laughs> we needed to, we then found ourselves in the position where uh, we were sort of being commoditized by Kubernetes and we were this sort of thin layer between um, container orchestration frameworks and, and storage underneath. Um, so we, we realized that we had to pivot again, um, but unfortunately at that point we had already scaled too large really to be able to move quickly enough. Right. Um, and that's, um, that premature scaling, sort of believing our own hype and believing that um, we, we had achieved product market fit before we really had, um, I think that that's the reason why, why Cluster HQ wasn't successful ultimately. Um, but um, I then took a year out uh, to work at Weaveworks, and I had a fantastic mm -hmm. time working at Weave. Um, yeah. Really great team there, really great products. So I recommend you go try Weave Cloud as well. Um, and I was working on developer experience at Weave, where um, that was super fun because I got involved in teaching and uh, talking about um, everything from container networking to Prometheus monitoring uh, to visualization to continuous delivery with Kubernetes and uh, got to meet a lot of people and, and had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but I guess I just still had the itch to come back to the container storage world. Um, right. And so I then launched um, this project dot mesh, um, which we just launched on Wednesday this week. And uh, it's not it's not actually really container storage anymore. It's more about data management for cloud native applications. Um, so, uh, right. so we, 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 can, we get to that in a moment. Really, trying to understand from a UX point of view, from like use case and so on, what it's about. But you're going to tell us everything about it. Um, just. Like the last thing you said there, uh, I, I mean, we know each other maybe from SIG um, Cluster Life Cycle, and yes. you've been doing a lot of great work there. I hope you continue that. I will, yes. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that now the time is probably like stuff has settled. Like Kubernetes is kind of like, you know, the, the container orchestration world over, Kubernetes is the container orchestrator. And it's really now kind of like the time where you can actually build stuff on top of that and actually also be 
um, successful in terms of a business, uh, yes. you know, applying a certain business model. At least that's how I see it. So without further ado, let's get into dot .NET. Cool. Okay. Awesome. No, and I completely agree with you. Um, uh, what, that, that was another one of the challenges at Cluster HQ was we, we didn't know which orchestrator was going to win, so we had to sort of support Swarm and Kubernetes and Mesos. Good with Mesos. Um, but absolutely. So um, so yeah, it, it is definitely easier now that, that things have settled. And I mean, mm -hmm. we're even getting our stuff working on Kubernetes on Docker for Mac. And it's really nice to see that Docker have embraced like running a local Kubernetes cluster for development on Docker for yeah. Mac in a nice way. So, yeah, good for them. Uh, so, so that, that's pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about, about Dot Mesh. Um, I've got a couple of slides actually that I can use to sort of just paint a picture. Um, yeah, that would be just, I've really just done it in the form of uh, sort of three memes. So uh, let me just share my screen quickly. And um, so hopefully, uh, just a second, can you see that? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're both software engineers and we know what it looks like when it's a bad day at work. Um, and so these are sort of three stories that, that we learned from talking to dozens and dozens of users and potential customers uh, sort of late last year. And um, uh, the, first, um, the first way that it can be a bad day at work, and so it would be a really bad day at work if all three of these things happened. But the, the first one is that uh, you have a change to an application that you're developing, it passes all the tests in CI and you deploy it in production and it blows up. Um, this happens surprisingly often. It's happened to me, it's happened uh, uh, at companies I've worked with and it's uh, really painful because it means that you're exposing your users and your customers um, to, uh, to failures, to errors and, and so on. And so you have to ask the question, why does this happen? And the reason that things pass the tests and then they blow up in production is that um, production is just fundamentally different to all the other environments that you have. Um, it has different data, um, it has a different scale, it has different inputs as well. So even just the requests that are hitting production are often gonna be different and more varied than the, the um, inputs that you use when you're, when you're testing your software in CI. Um, so that's the first problem, and that's a big problem to solve. Um, and we're not going to solve all of that problem in one go, but it's it's interesting to just sort of set the scene. Um, the second one, and um, I'm sure you know XKCD, I've actually modified this XKCD slightly. It used to say that the number one programmer excuse for legitimately slacking off is that uh, your code was compiling, but actually in 2018, compilers are quite fast now. And the number one programmer excuse for legitimately slacking off 2018 edition is that the integration tests are running. And oftentimes I've seen um, uh, problems at companies where you just can't seem to ship stuff. Like the dev team is just slow for some reason and stuff is late and everyone gets stressed um, and it can be a bit of a mess. And if, if what I'm saying sounds familiar, there's often uh, the, the cause of this is often that there's a slow CI system with slow and flaky tests at the heart of the problem. Um, and so how, how can we make our CI systems faster? How can we make our tests faster and more reliable? Another interesting fact about this is that the more realistic your testing gets, the slower and flakier it tends to get. So end-to-end -end tests that test maybe 50 different microservices together using, um, using real databases are often and pretty much guaranteed to be slower and flakier than unit tests that can run quickly um, using uh, sort of prepackaged data that's that's shipped as part of the test. And of course, can I quickly stop you, stop yeah, you there, and, and like, what do you think about that? I heard that a couple of times, and when I said it myself, I, I got you know quite a lot of heat there. I said like, hey, in the context of you know containers, microservices, and whatnot, we're dealing with in our space, you don't actually do, really do like you don't have a QA environment anymore. You don't have um, you know, you don't really do tests, you directly go into pro product and, you know, you just expose this new version to a very small, uh, you know, it's kind of like post smoke test, you just expose it to a small uh, part of the audience. And then, you know, if you're experiencing trouble there, well, you, you don't go and then roll it out for everyone, you just, you know, roll it back for these 0.1% or whatever. What do you think about that? 
Yes, yeah, so that's really great. Um, that that approach is fantastic if you're at sufficiently large scale that you can get signif like statistically significant data about whether the new <coughs> is good by rolling it out to a tiny percent. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that. That 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 if you're if you've got enough um, uh, if you've got sufficient scale to do that sort of uh, canary or blue green testing, um, then absolutely go for it. Um, the the, there's an interesting um, the, the, there's an interesting case there though where if the change that you're deploying depends on on data, um, if the change that you're deploying, for example, updates a schema in a database, then you can't like fork your database into the old version and the new version. Um, the, um, the the canary approach to testing new code changes only really works for stateless applications. Um, so there's there's an aspect there of uh, needing something a little bit stronger for for stateful. Right, so in a nutshell, if you're not happen to be you know Facebook or Google or Twitter or whatever, keep on listening and, and keep on doing what you're suggesting here. Right? In a nutshell, absolutely yes. And I'd like to talk to people at Facebook and Twitter and Google as well about what they do and 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 so on. So anyway, I'll I'll proceed uh, with 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 the third um, category that we have here. So uh, this one is that one does not simply capture the state of four microservices at once. And uh, what I mean here is that as we see a progression towards microservices, um, there's this thing called polyglot persistence, which is where um, the right way to do stateful microservices is that each microservice only talks to uh, one, sorry, each database is only uh, talked to by one microservice. Um, and and basically, the, the upshot of this is that instead of having one large database at the center of your application, you'll end up with many. You'll end up with a database for your orders service, a database for your users service, a database for whatever other uh, domain-specific data there is for, for whatever your application does. And what this means is that when you're testing an application, when you're doing development on an application, um, you might be spinning up maybe four or five different databases on your laptop, if you can even spin up your uh, microservices all on one laptop. Um, and that means that there's lots of state in lots of different places. And it's it's just so hard to capture all of that state in one go in order to, for example, share a problem state that you've developed in, in development with a colleague to help you debug it. The people just don't do it. It's just that it, it's so hard that people just don't bother. You'd have to like um, exec into all your containers and, and dump their state and like zip up those states and then email it to them or something and it would just take so long it's not worth it. Instead, you can note, people, sorry, just just one quick note. Not everyone might might be familiar. I mean, people probably know polyglot programming, but might not really be that familiar with polyglot persistence. Just to be clear, it's like it's not a top down thing, right? It's not that you know, oh, we have to use five different kinds of data stores. So here. We use some some SQL and here's some you know Elasticsearch and here's some Cassandra. It's really like depending on your workload, you know, for for shopping basket, you only might need some you know Redis or whatever, and for some transaction stuff, you might need some SQL. And that's like bottom up. That's why you end up with different um, data kind of data stores really that you know, treat data differently, uh, and then then you arrive at essentially that. I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page that you know this is really bottom up, same as polyglot programming. It's not that you know oh you have to use five different programming languages. It's no no no. It essentially grows bottom up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think pol polyglot persistence is sort of an um, uh, an effect. Um, that you see uh, sort of an emergent behavior that you see <laughs> when you do microservices rather than like the CIO saying we must have five different databases. It's, it's, it's sort of a consequence of doing microservices properly. Um, and absolutely, it's, it's not like, oh, we have to use five different microservices or five different databases like because. It's, it's because each team is given autonomy over developing um, the the microservice that they're working on in, in the language that's most appropriate for it and also the data store that's most appropriate for it. So if you're working on the search service, it probably makes sense to use Elasticsearch as your data store. Um, if you're working on uh, data that tends to be sort of ephemeral, then Redis might be a good choice. Whereas if it's something like a user's service, which 
uh, the is is more is the the, the sort of uh, transactional um, aspect of it is more important than a traditional SQL like Postgres or MySQL would would probably make more sense. Right. Cool. Um, so uh, so anyway, you end up with this problem where it's so hard to capture um, the state of multiple microservices at once in uh, in development that people just don't do it. And so what you see instead is like, oh, can you SSH into my machine to see this, to look at this problem? Or, or even if you're in the same building, can you come over here and look at this problem over my shoulder and help me fix it? Um, and of course, that doesn't really work very well if you're in a team. Um, uh, for one thing, it, it means that you have to interrupt people and you have to synchronize uh, human um, focus uh, between um, between these environments where the where the data is, uh, but it also uh, it, it goes badly when um, when you're in different time zones or uh, when uh, there's um, lo lots of different teams. So I think there's a better way of, of dealing with this problem, basically. And um, so if you take a step back, then uh, you can see that there are problems. Um, the problems I've described. Uh, touch all the different stages of the software development lifecycle. Um, in production, an unexpected production outage uh, can often happen because tests aren't realistic enough with respect to data. Um, in CI, you often get these end-to-end -end tests that manipulate real databases that are slow um, and they're flaky. And in development, uh, microservices and polyglot persistence make capturing and sharing development states hard enough that no one does it. So these are the things that we found when we started talking to people um, about microservices and data. And um, I think that if you take a step back uh, and think about, well, what's the common theme between all of those problems that I just described? In all of those cases, uh, they happen because you weren't in control of data. And so then the interesting question that, that follows from that um, is, well, what are you in control of and what does control mean in modern software development? Um, and modern software is all about control. Uh, we've been able to control our code. Well, so firstly, what, what is modern software made out of? I think um, the, the modern software being made out of code, infrastructure, and data is a reasonable way of dividing up um, the world. And um, we've been in control of code for the longest time, probably for two decades, we've had version control. And more recently, we've seen the emergence of continuous integration, meaning that code um, is, is controlled by the fact that it is continuously tested. Um, more recently than that, we've seen the development of uh, control over your infrastructure, in particular, the movement towards immutable infrastructure uh, with things like Docker and Kubernetes, but also um, uh, declarative config being applied to um, cloud resources with things like Terraform um, and the state of your server uh, like Ansible has has all sort of converged on us actually having quite good control over, over our infrastructure now and being able to um, uh, recover from uh, machines failing by having something like Kubernetes automatically spin up new pods on, on different machines um, uh, based on a declarative config. And so this is really powerful. But um, we still are in this state where data is outside of the circle of control. Um, and the way that we've uh, learned that people deal with data is very often um, using scripts that they've written or manual processes. A surprising number of companies, or maybe it's not surprising, but a, a, a huge number of companies still have uh, DBAs and you send the DBA uh, an email or you make a phone call if you want a snapshot of your production data and so on. Um, and so I feel like there's broadly uh, space for data to be brought back into or sort of, sorry, brought into the circle of control. Um, and that's our mission uh, with, with Dot Mesh and that's what we're trying to do. So the obvious next question then is how do you bring data into the circle of control? And what I'd like to propose is that you do it with a mesh. And so the mesh looks something like that. Um, you have, uh, we're proposing that you include um, uh, this service called dot hub in the center of your mesh. And then around the edges of the mesh, we've got these different environments. Uh, we've got a development environment um, of one developer. We've got another development environment, uh, another developer. This first development environment might be a laptop. Um, the second development environment might be a VM. Um, then we've got the CI system, of course, which is uh, running tests against code as it as it flows from dev into ultimately staging and prod. 
Um, then you have staging, and like you say, staging maybe is going away, or maybe there's more advanced versions of staging that are happening, like um, a Kubernetes namespace per branch, for example. Um, but in all of those cases, um, uh, there, there are often still environments in between the CI system and, and production. And then, of course, we have production itself, where, uh, where your workload is, is running and serving production traffic. Um, and once you have a mesh, you can do some interesting things. And so the first use case that we're proposing with dot mesh is developer collaboration. And it's this idea that if developer one um, has a problem state or some interesting state, maybe they found a security vulnerability in an app and they've and you can only reproduce it by getting the databases into a certain special interesting state that they can capture that dot. Uh, we call them data dots. We can capture that state in a dot and then um, the developer can uh, commit that dot just like a git repo and push that state that interesting state up to the dot hub another developer can then come and pull down that state um, and debug the problem and uh, develop some uh, some code changes that that address it there's also an interesting uh, use case for capturing failed ci runs so uh, we've talked to customers where uh, they have a ci system that involves um, a lot of um, a lot of microservices being pulled together in in one pipeline uh, and tested end to end. And whenever that pipeline goes red, the really interesting thing is that they have to stop the entire office committing changes because they have to SSH into the test runners and go and poke around with the databases to find out what went wrong. And so wouldn't it be so much better if instead of having to SSH into the test runners, you could just capture the state of a failed CI run um, in a way that is uh, sort of reproducible, both in terms of code and data, and pull that state down to, uh, uh, to uh, a, developer, a developer that might be um, wanting to reproduce that state um, at a later time or in a different time zone and certainly in a different environment. Um, so that's the second use case. And then the third use case is pulling realistic data from production. Um, and this is going more into the territory of things that we are going to be able to do in the future. I, I wouldn't recommend anyone uses .mesh 0.1 to try and do this yet, but it's sort of the direction we're going in. Is this ability to take production data, capture that in a data dot, um, and pull that down uh, maybe every hour or every night. Um, scrub that data, of course, because you want to remove personally identifiable information from it, and then pull that down into a staging environment or, or a CI environment to run tests against, or even development. So what you can see here is everything that we're doing is about moving these data dots around between different stages of the software development lifecycle, and that it unlocks a new set of uh, DevOps workflows. That's super exciting. And myself, I have a you know background in data engineering. I was at MapR, and so, so I, I really appreciate and understand all these these issues. Let me quickly try to reformulate that in my own words to see if I really got it, because you know I did honestly not get it so far. I played around with it, I looked at the blog and so on, but I did not really get it. Um, is it fair to say that dot mesh is kind of like the, the Istio for data? So essentially, rather than having ad hoc solutions that, you know, say this in, in CI and capture that with a shell script or whatever, put it there on S3 or whatever and having ad hoc things or even you know, make it part of the application, you kind of outsource that. And the mesh is actually taking care of, you know, here a snapshot, here move it from that environment to that environment. In the same way that Istio, you know, essentially says, don't do that in the application. We're doing it in the, the data plane of, of, of the service mesh and say, these two services can communicate or, or you inject some failure or troubleshoot it, whatever, in the same way that, that, that dot .mesh does that for your data. Is that kind of Yes, fair? I think that's a very good way of describing it. Um, I might use that, thank you. Um, I think that the, um, the, 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 the really important aspect of what you just said is that it's a, generic solution uh, the word generic might not be the right word but it, it's a generalized yeah. solution for dealing with data snapshots um, across all different stages of the software development lifecycle independent of which kind of databases you're using uh, independent of which infrastructure you're running on whether it's cloud or on-prem or laptops or whatever right. um, and it's about um, providing a set of tools that work in a consistent way in a generalized way across all of those different environments to give developers the power to get the data that they need in the place that they need it when they need it. Got it. Um, so. that, that 
that yields the very interesting question, the technical challenging question. I don't doubt that you, know, you and your team are able to tackle that, but it does. Um, like there are like many, many different data stores and databases on the market, right? You have all the original database, you have you know any kind of NoSQL, NewSQL, and whatever SQL. Um, does that actually mean that for any kind of like let's let's say you have five different market tools, you're using Elasticsearch, you're using Cassandra, you're using Postgres, you're using MySQL, and you're using Redis? Yeah, you only have four or uh, five now. For each of those data stores, that you know, using data store is a kind of umbrella term for any kind of database and whatever, you essentially have a kind of like plug-in driver or whatever that actually understands the snapshotting, whatever operations of that particular data store. And you're providing then a generalized generic interface to actually just say like, yeah, snapshot that, move that here and so on. That kind of like... So, um... So that would be one way to do it. It's not the way that we've started out doing it though. So okay. um, the the way that we have started doing it um, is instead to provide a layer that sits underneath the, each database because every database uh, that you just mentioned writes files to a file system. Um, and so we provide a snapshotting engine that sits underneath that just allows you to take consistent atomic snapshots of the file system state of those data stores. Now, that does rely on the data stores being crash consistent. And it does mean that, um, for example, we rely on the fact that Postgres has a write ahead log. And we rely on the fact that my MySQL in ODB um, can recover from a power outage. But all of these data stores can recover from having the power ripped out from right. the machine that they're running on. Um, and so, um, so we can sort of recover these atomic snapshots um, Right. In different environments, and we can take the snapshots without without stopping the database. That is awesome, and I think needed. Otherwise, certain use cases might not be possible. The only thing I'm having troubles understanding is if you're working on the file system layer, and many you know bigger or there there are some databases that actually you know kind of bypass the, the file system. They directly want to have you know, raw blocks that they are dealing with. How does that work in, in this case? So I haven't seen a database that does that in quite a long time. Um, okay. uh, we would have an answer for that. You, we could provide a, a snapshotable partition rather than a snapshotable POSIX file system, um, but we haven't seen that that's needed yet. Um, okay. And um, yeah, I think um, probably 80% plus of the databases that we see um, or that exist in the world, probably more than eighty percent, uh, just write files to disk uh, on a files on a file system. Um, it's definitely an interesting question, though, and, and and sort of another interesting aspect to it, and like sort of playing devil's advocate with myself mm -hmm. here, is that how do you then deal with sharded databases? Um, because <laughs> being able so to how do you actually deal with um... If the data is sharded across different nodes, good, good, good. Point well, there. I'll be very honest with you. At the moment, we don't. So, at the moment, we're focusing on these dev and CI use cases, and so we're assuming that you can run uh, your stack on um, uh, on a single machine, basically. Uh, but at the same time, Dot Mesh does already support running in clustered mode. Um, uh, it just has the restriction that uh, each each data dot is only on one machine at a time, but you can have many of them spread across many machines, if that makes sense. Got it. Um, but there are just there are definitely definitely some interesting questions around how to deal with uh, being able to capture the state of a sharded or distributed database. Um, and I'll just say that's sort of a research topic that we're investigating at the moment, and we hope to have a solution for it in due course. That's that's brilliant. I mean, I personally prefer these kind of like upfront, like saying, "Look, uh, this is what you can do, and here are the limitations or whatever." Mm -hmm. um, over like you know we're gonna solve all the problems of the world and boiling down to well actually <laughs> by the way in your case it doesn't work um, yeah. I will have to to research and follow up regarding the I, I thought at least in my experience many years ago uh, that Oracle would be one of those who actually you know directly mainly relational databases and then mm -hmm. probably you know you're spot on with with most of the like you know Elasticsearch and whatnot they they actually at the end of the day just you know have some local file system X4 or whatever that that does all the heavy lifting and they're just working on top of that file system. Yeah. Uh, but the sharded thing, like that is that is something where you maybe even 
you know, don't need the solution yourself. You might need only to plug into solutions of others and you might mm -hmm. draw from there's the actually, experience you had with Flocker. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a really interesting um, uh, project called Canister uh, from a company called Caston. Um, and I was uh, speaking to them yesterday and um, there's an interesting opportunity to potentially collaborate around that because uh, Caston are taking the approach to um, that you first described, which is that you integrate with each data store using the data store native backup tools, basically. Um, which is expensive. That means that it can work with um, that it can work with uh, sharded databases because the sharded database knows how to back itself up. Right. Um, right, right. So it's definitely it's it's really cool that like that that Caston and Dot Mesh are like exploring these two. Uh, sort of possible solutions to the space in parallel. And also the other thing that's really cool is that Canister um, is open source, um, which is awesome. the, uh, the the project that, that Caston have for actually integrating with these individual uh, data stores. So um, uh, it may well make sense that in the future we can leverage some of that and, and use, uh, use that project. And like shifting gears a little bit, um... There is that not necessarily new, it's I think alpha now, um, initiative within Kubernetes or actually wider container system called the CSI, right? Mm -hmm. Container storage yep. interface. Uh, can you kind of like for our audience put what you're offering here with, with dot mesh, put that in relation or, or, you know, what is that the same? Does it overlap? Could the one influence the other or how does it relate to CSI? Yeah. So, so my understanding of CSI, the container storage interface is that it's exactly that. It's an interface. So it's a set of a, it's an API that you implement if you're a storage provider, um, and that's really nice because Kubernetes is not saying we're going to create storage. They're saying like we're going to let everyone plug their storage into Kubernetes, and so for us with Dot Mesh, uh, we already plug into Kubernetes. So we have um, a flex volume driver, uh, which is sort of the precursor to CSI, and we have also a dynamic provisioner, which is the new way that. Um, that Kubernetes allows you to uh, do lifecycle operations on volumes like create and destroy. Uh, and then the flex volume driver is the thing that does attach and detach. Um, and I believe, I need to look more into CSI, uh, but I believe that CSI covers um, the flex volume side. It's like a, a, the, the a new version of the flex volume driver. Um, and um, it's just a nicer interface than, than the flex API, I think. And we'll definitely support that. Uh, when it's ready. And the other interesting thing is that um, uh, Kubernetes is working and, and Sig Storage is working on uh, on snapshot uh, on snapshots, and it would totally make sense to expose dot mesh commits um, as snapshots through the Kubernetes snapshot API once that exists. Um, so we're going to be getting more involved in Sig Storage, and we're going to be helping to actually write code uh, and offer our <laughs> Um, uh, offer our engineering efforts to, um, to to move all of those efforts forwards a little bit and um, and to make sure that we can provide uh, implementations of those APIs as they develop. That totally makes sense. My hope actually is going a bit further, really, that um, the the uh, the spec, the emerging spec or, or whatever standard, whatever in that space, is actually informed by and, and, and influenced and, and shaped by by what you guys have put forward there. Because so to me, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean. Um, there are not that many generic, or uh, actually, I only know you, your work there, your offering there, that actually does that in the snapshotting part and, and mm -hmm. in the context of containers and so on. So, you know, actually, it should be the other way around, right? You know, dot mesh should be the, the <laughs> this is the, the reference implementation or whatever, and the, the spec should flow from that. But okay, we're getting it. Well, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't want to go charging in and telling everyone what to do. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go and uh, listen and, and get involved That's... in the open source effort. Yeah. Um, in, in a way, but um, yeah, no, that absolutely cool. Um, so, um, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say I've got um, I've got a short demo that I can share. Oh, please, yes, mm. yeah, cool. I tried um, it out uh, I think yesterday, and it's like in terms of flow, like awesome. I just didn't get the underlying motivation. Absolutely cool. Um, where would I use that? <laughs> um, yeah, so actually, I'll I'll just point out a couple of things. So um, before I before I go through the demo, um, you can see my screen now, right? Yes, sir. I do. Cool. So I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, the the website at dotmesh.com is now live, um, and 
there's install instructions on the home page because we put loads of effort into making it just really easy to install. Um, and that just sets up a local Docker environment with, with dot mesh. Um, and, uh, then also I just wanted to point out the, um, the doc site. So, um, I'll just open this in a new tab. Uh, so the doc site is linked to from the home page and has lots of interesting information about what dot mesh is and how to install it includes more detailed installation instructions on Kubernetes, for example. Um, so there's a set of tutorials here. We launched with, with nine tutorials um, and it, it covers sort of the hello world uh, and then uh, using dot mesh as a library, collaborating with dot mesh, uh, the hello world on Kubernetes, and then also capturing failed states in CI, uh, which we've got working so far with Travis Jenkins and GitLab. And the GitLab uh, tutorial is especially cool because um, the Travis and Jenkins one integrate with Docker, but the GitLab one integrates with Kubernetes. So uh, go and check that out. Um, and then we've got a simple example of dot mesh with MySQL and then also a sub dots tutorial. Um, so what I'll show you today is just the, the hello world. Um, but what I think the point at which dot mesh gets really interesting and powerful is when you start looking at the library and collaboration use cases. So I'll, I just want to show you a, a section of this of this uh, tutorial. Um, the um, basically we in this tutorial we've got a um, a sample app that is split up into microservices, and um, it just so happens that there's four bugs in the app, um, and uh, well, actually, there's three bugs, and, there, and there's there's one uh, case in which case in which you'd want to capture uh, some data to, to use later. But the most interesting bug is this security vulnerability. So it's we've discovered, or a developer has discovered, how an unprivileged user can set the default image for all new users. Um, the the app itself is is just this silly little app that lets you like click to add logos on the screen. Um, but the version of the app that's used in this tutorial. Um, is uh, is one that also has a user's service and allows users to sign up and log in. And so there's a security vulnerability, but the security vulnerability depends on a uh, state that is in um, uh, these three different databases at once. So we've got a Postgres, uh, sorry, a Redis database for this clicks DB. Uh, we've got a Postgres database for the users DB, and then we've got files that the user up the users upload. Um, and so this comes back to this sort of one does not simply meme. Um, now it actually is possible to capture the state of all three of those databases at the same time. Um, and then you, you find these bugs and it turns out that this security vulnerability bug actually depends on the state in the database being in a certain way for all three of those databases. Um, so what dot mesh allows you to do is to capture that security bug and then over in the collaboration tutorial, um, we pretend that we don't know how we cause the bug, which is entirely plausible. It might be possible that a developer comes across a security vulnerability and doesn't actually know exactly what happened. And, and this comes down to the question of, as software developers, what do we spend most of our time doing? Very much, very often, we spend our time looking for clues. Um, so we're, what we're doing is we're inspecting state to try and find clues and form a hypothesis. Um, and so what you can do is we're, with dot mesh, we're giving you another dimension on which to find clues. It's no longer just, oh, th this version of the code caused this problem. It's this version of the code together with this particular interesting state that might be spread across three different microservices databases. Um, so anyway, that's that's basically just sort of what I got excited about when I was writing these tutorials, uh, is this idea of um, uh, you can actually use dot mesh to to find clues form a hypothesis um, and then uh, do what we call reducing the mean time to clue um, <laughs> and if you can reduce the the average amount of time it takes for a developer to find the first and then the second clue um, then you can speed up software development and i think that's that's where things get really interesting quick question like i i did the um the katakoda uh, one that you have online there which is super mm -hmm. smooth you just go there clickety click you don't need to set up anything locally uh awesome um that reminds me a bit of you know in in again coming back to the analogy with with the service mesh in, in istio there's this thing that you can inject failures right you can say yeah. oh um you know every third one is a 404 or whatever mm -hmm. and, you know oh you can try it out is there some current thing in dot mesh you can actually kind of like you know inject 
like a schema, broke a schema, whatever is anything there, or <laughs> yeah, I, I don't could, know. I'm... You could use dot mesh to capture a schema that you'd broken in a certain way, or some data that didn't upgrade properly when you tried to apply a schema modification to it. And and I believe that's valuable when dealing with um, with with trying to collaborate on uh, with, with other developers about states. You basically you build up this library of states in the dot hub, which is our SaaS service um, of interesting states that are interesting to the entire team and which anyone can take off the shelf at any point and just reinflate. And you've got your code and your data um, in the same place rather than just having uh, code. And address the data in the um, dot hub <laughs> is <laughs> encrypted or? Uh, not yet, but soon. That's yeah. something that we've heard. Um, Probably a requirement. Before. So yeah, it's okay. currently not encrypted. We currently encrypt uh, in-flight data to and from .hub, yeah. uh, but not at rest yet. Um, but yeah, that's that's clearly something we're going to need Up, to do. Upcoming future. Cool. cool. We've got a few more minutes. Um, if you want to like talk a bit more, like you know, roadmap items or whatever, kind of like you know, what's coming up in the next release? What do you plan to do in the next couple of weeks or months? Besides getting a little bit of sleep, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, just before I before I touch on roadmap, um, yeah. the uh, uh, I kind of just showed you the tutorials. I didn't actually go through the demo. Um, cool. uh, shall I shall I go through this yeah, demo sure. now? Sure. Or? Let's do it. No, yeah. let's do it. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so just for for everyone who's who's watching, um, uh, I also encourage everyone to try it themselves. So you can go to dotmesh.com/try-dotmesh. It's also linked to from the homepage, and and you get this little tutorial here. Um, so, so what we've got here, we've got this host environment. We've got a real uh, computer running here. We can see. Um, I think I need to reload the page. Um, so we've got a real computer here. You can see it's actually running Linux. Um, and uh, then we can run through the tutorial really quickly. So we can install the .dot mesh client binary. And then we use the dot mesh client binary uh, to create a single node dot mesh cluster that's running on this machine. And the only dependency here is that you have a computer running Linux with, with Docker so installed. This, so this essentially sets up your dot hub or? No, it sets up a local dot mesh cluster that can then push and pull data to and from the dot hub. Got it. Got cool. It. So we can check that, well, yes, uh, it's, it's up and running. It's running the 0 0.1 release. That's wonderful. And then we can go and clone this uh, this demo repo. Now, this is the um, the sort of simple version of of the uh, of the application I was talking about. It's the one before you have multiple microservices. So this is why I call it sort of a hello world because it's just really super simple. So you can run this dm list command, and you can see that just spinning up this Docker compose file has created a data dot. And um, I can show you how. Uh, that happened by looking at the docker compose file here. Um, and uh, so you can see that there's um, uh, under this Redis in the docker compose file, you can see there's a volume driver called DM specified and a volume called Moby counter. And that's why uh, when we okay. spun up um, the docker compose, uh, uh, dot mesh created the volume called Moby counter because it didn't exist yet. So I can now do DM switch to Moby counter. And DM switch is a little bit like in Git, you have to CD into a directory before, into a repo before you can do things. Um, of course, there, there is no manifestation of the data dot on, in the file system directly because it's all attached to this Redis container. So your DM switch is kind of like CD. Um, and then from there on in, it's, it's just regular uh, sort of Git-like commands, except they operate on, on a database or, or uh, potentially a set of databases. And that's where the, the library tutorial comes in because it actually runs uh, three different containers on the same dot in different sub dots. Um, but anyway, the, the simple example is that we can then capture the empty state. Uh, we can check out a new branch. Uh, you can then load the app up um, in your browser and uh, let's put an A on the screen. And this uh, very, very space, simple app. Right? That's Sorry? essentially popul that creates state that populates the data store. Exactly. So this is putting the location of each of the clicks in the Redis database. And you can see if I reload the page, um, then it must be persistent because it remembers the A. Um, but then the next thing that we can do uh, is that we can capture that state with A on the screen. 
And the other interesting thing is that we can then go uh, onto the master branch and our data has disappeared because on the master branch, there was no A on the screen. And so we can now actually make, I'll go a little bit off piste here. Uh, we can uh, create a new branch called branch B. Um, and then D, uh, now we're on branch B, we can do DM branch to, to see that. We're now on branch B and we can put a B on the screen. There. I'll do it quickly. <laughs> right, uh, right. We are going to award prizes for the most creative art that's being created, <laughs> by the way. Um, they they and, get t-shirts, uh, right? Uh, a B on the screen. Um, and I can just do DM checkout branch A. Um, and I switch that state from B, from B to A. And then I can go back to branch uh, B and um, I'm back to B. So it's this basic idea that you can start to treat your containerized databases like a Git repo. Um, and that that works even if you have more than one microservice and you can capture a single atomic commit that captures the state of, of more than one database at once. So I'll leave the demo there because I know we're short on time. Um, uh, I encourage everyone to try the demo because the next step in the demo is pushing that branch to the dot hub and then uh, pulling it down onto your local machine to prove uh, oh, that right. you can move data around. But um, yeah, I'll leave the demo there to, to give people something to try at home as well. Perfect, quick, quick question, so the dot hub which is essentially this, this central, like like GitHub for for code. Um, currently, is essentially your SaaS offering, so you. That's you're right. Essentially, using the, that part. But I, I suppose if I want to have that, you know, in the enterprise behind the firewall, then I'm going to reach out to your big sales team that will tell me how much money I have to put on the table. Yes. Uh, so that's yeah. that's very well said. Um, and um, I'll I'll just I'll just bring up our, our pricing page quickly because. Um, yes, please. If you go to dot mesh, uh, then there's a section on pricing. Um, it, before I talk about pricing, it's very important to point out that dot mesh itself is open source. Um, cool. It's cool. available on GitHub at uh, dot mesh io dot mesh. Um, and I'm a strong believer in the necessity that the open source is is feature complete and powerful. Yeah. And that's why dot mesh, the open source, um, is um, it supports clustering. It supports everything that you can do uh, with the dot hub today, uh, apart from the web interface. Um, and so if you want to run your own version of, of dot mesh on premise, then you can do that just by picking up the open source um, and you can you can run it and operate it. Um, with that said, however, um, we are a business and we do need to make money. And uh, so we're offering a sort of a, a hosted version of dot mesh um, as at dot hub dot com. Um, and you can go to .hub.com and, and see that it's uh, uh, it, it's a SaaS service that, um, for example, I'm I'm logged in here as Luke Marsden. I can see yep. my different branches. It looks and feels a tiny bit like GitHub. Um, yeah. Um, um, and this interface is is uh, is this is the start of the thing that we're going to turn into an enterprise version. Mm -hmm. So on the pricing page, you can see that there's a free tier, so you can come and try it for as long as you like. Uh, with a with a gig of storage for free, um, uh, as soon as you bump over that that one gig limit, then it's a very very simple ten dollars per per user per month for our uh, for our developer accounts, which, which is um, it's the price of the the second cheapest uh, DigitalOcean droplet. So uh, we we priced it sort of with respect to 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 what developers uh, are used to paying for things. But then as you start adding team and, and business features and functionality, um, the price goes up accordingly. And then there's the enterprise version, which as we develop more features in the dot hub that are specific to the SaaS, um, then uh, those are going to be the things that eventually um, turn into, we hope, sort of the, uh, the more scalable business model um, where you can run uh, a version of the dot hub on premise um, and we can help and support you doing that. Brilliant. You know, that's that's super exciting and I finally like, I can really say, all right, I, I was excited yesterday, but now I kind of like I got it. I understand oh. what you're you're doing here. Um and I will totally, you know, currently still on, on the free plan on, on that hub, so I'm gonna upgrade to the developers. I'm gonna, gonna <laughs> use that. It's really awesome. I, I love it. I love uh, I hope people out there can appreciate it much as I do because you, awesome. know, you, you yeah, do need a little you. bit of a background in, in data to, to really get it that it's this is really kick ass this is really that's the future and uh, thanks a lot for your time Luke I awesome. hope uh, we'll, we'll see you soon uh, in person and, and uh, continue the discussion over a pint or whatever but 
Um, congratulations again. This is really awesome. And uh, I hope that, you know, whoever has a question would just um, you know, be able to reach out via your support channel, Slack, or yes, whatever you Yes, absolutely. That's worth mentioning. Um, please do yep. come and join um, just on our homepage. Uh, it's actually a little bit hidden at the moment. I want to uh, move it more obvious, but there's a little Slack link down here. Um, so please uh, come uh, join our Slack. That just takes you straight to the Slack invite page. Um, so yeah, come join our Slack and, and chat to us, give us feedback, uh, or reach out to us on Twitter, um, twitter.com slash get.mesh, because uh, .mesh was taken. So um, yeah, uh, really look forward to continuing the conversation. And um, thank you, Michael, for taking the time. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Cheers. Bye.